After making Roblox games for some years now, I've decided to start a scripting tutorial series that should be a simple but detailed introduction for anyone who wants to be a developer on the website. I will be starting with basic concepts and slowly move into the more complex side of making games. On a side note, this series is kind of my way of passing on what I've learned to anyone who can make use out of it. I don't plan on using Roblox anymore for future games because of its limitations, but that doesn't mean it's a bad engine. It is a very nice starting point for a long-term game development career and it's what got me into game development in the first place. With that out of the way, let's get started. So the first thing you want to do is navigate to the Create page on the website and click the Edit button on a game. Or if you want to start fresh, hit the Create New Game button. After clicking Edit, it will ask you to download Roblox Studio if you haven't installed it before. Make sure you get it up and running before moving on because this will be your new all-purpose tool to game development. So after opening Studio, you'll see a bar at the top of the screen that hosts all the tools you have at your disposal. Realistically, only a few of them will be used in day-to-day -day work, so don't worry about every little detail of the menu. But it is important to know your tabs. The Home tab has what you'll probably be using the most. Simple transform tools, the toolbox, materials, colors, the UI editor, and other nifty features such as the playtest button. I will go into more detail on that in the future. The Model tab is where you'll find tools mainly useful for building in physics. Constraints and unions deserve their own video though, so don't worry if you don't use most of this stuff just yet. The test tab is good for playtesting with multiplayer and simulating servers without having to test everything in actual servers. The view tab is one of the most useful tabs because it allows you to enable and disable windows and widgets, all of which can be moved around and organized on the screen any way you'd like. For example, Enabling the Properties window will open up a window that allows you to edit selected objects. You can move it around by clicking and dragging on the top part, and it will embed itself in the main window if you put it near an edge. Finally, there is the Plugins tab. By default, there are a few plugins already, but you can find more in the toolbox under the Plugins section. The Animation Editor plugin will get its own dedicated video. Heading back to the View tab, I would recommend keeping the Properties and Explorer windows open at all times because you'll be using them quite often. The Command Bar may also come in handy. Arrange them on screen any way you'd want. Also, if for some reason you wanted to hide the top bar of the studio, click that tiny little arrow on the top right of the screen. It's to the left of the What's New button. I never use it. And now for the most useful menu in my opinion, the Explorer. What's that? This is where you'll find every object in your game. By default, there are already things here that you'll be able to make use of in the future. And these are called services. Don't worry about them just yet. Anyway, selecting an object in the Explorer is the same thing as selecting an object in the main menu. What is a menu? Selecting an object in the Explorer is the same as selecting an object in the main window. But this way allows you to select things without needing to find them with your camera. Some useful selection tips include... If you hold control, you can click multiple Psst, Hey, I don't know what this guy's talking about, but here's a little image that shows what he wanted to say. He's kind of stupid, I don't know what he's doing. When an object or multiple objects are selected, the Properties menu will show information about what you have selected and allow you to change some other aspects. Any change made in the Properties menu will have an effect on everything selected. Objects in the Explorer don't necessarily have an order, but they do have a hierarchy. In Roblox, the hierarchy goes something like this. Objects that store other objects are called parents. Objects that are stored in other objects are called children. Any object that stores an object directly or indirectly is an ancestor. Any object that is either directly or indirectly stored in an object is a descendant. For example, the workspace is where physical objects are rendered. Any object stored in the workspace is a child, while the workspace is the parent. Parents can have multiple children, but the children can't have multiple parents. To change the parent of an object, click on it in the Explorer and drag it over another object. This will store that object inside of whatever you dragged it over. It is important to note that when objects are stored, they don't change physically. It's mainly just a way to keep track of things through code. It just makes it easy to find things. To demonstrate, if a player is stored in the workspace, and the player contains body parts, the player is a child of the workspace, and the body parts are children of the player. The body parts are not directly stored in the workspace, so they are not children of the workspace, but descendants, because they are indirectly stored in the workspace. The workspace is the parent of the player, and the player is the parent of the body parts. This makes the workspace an ancestor of the player and all of the player's body parts, whether it's directly or indirectly storing them. 
To put it simply, anything that directly stores an object as a parent, but also an ancestor of all of its objects and the objects that they store. Anything that is directly stored inside of an object is a child of its parent, but is also a descendant of the, all the parents of its parents. <sighs> this will make much more sense once we get into actually writing some code, so feel free to take a breather here. Next, we have the actual properties menu itself. This deals with what we call classes and data types. Because Roblox uses Lua as a primary coding language, you don't really have to deal with them much. But it's extremely helpful to understand the concept early on. To start off, data types are different kinds of information that are commonly used in sending values or transferring messages in code. Some basic data types include strings, integers, tables, and booleans. Booleans are the simplest because they can only have two values, true or false. Strings are just, well, text. Integers are strictly whole numbers, while numbers can have decimals. In reality, Roblox uses the word number to unify other data types like decimals, doubles, and floats. But all you really need to know is that when Roblox says number, it means a number that may or may not include a decimal. It's also important to know that in computer programming, there is a concept of round-off error. And this means that numbers with decimal values may not be 100% accurate all of the time. For example, using the value 0.1 can result in the value actually being set to a value very close to 0.1, but off by a super small amount. Usually it doesn't really matter that much, but it'll strike when you least expect it. So use integer values when you only want whole numbers, use number values when you're dealing with decimals. It's also important to note that there are upper and lower limits to all data types. For integers, that's the 64-bit integer limit. If an integer becomes too high, it will roll over to the lowest possible value due to overflow error. By the way, as a side note, most of the time integers are just called ints, I-N-T. Anyway, back to the video. There are other data types to cover, such as vectors and tables, but I would rather give them their own videos because of complexity. This is only an introduction video. Classes, on the other hand, are a very fundamental concept that could tie a lot of loose ends together. To put it simply, a class is a blueprint. A class is not an object, but the instructions for making an object. However, not all classes can necessarily create objects, and these types of classes are called abstract classes. Abstract classes are useful for arranging classes into groups via inheritance. Classes can inherit properties, functions, events, and other set instructions from each other. For example, using the built-in part class, you can tell the game to create an object. We call these instances. It will create a new object with the properties that the part class provides, along with other inherited data. In this case, the part class inherits from the base part class, which is a built-in abstract class that contains properties of behavior that all physical objects inherit from. Note that abstract classes cannot be instantiated, which means that you cannot create a base part, but you can create a part. You can visit the Roblox API reference manual at developer.roblox.com to see exactly what each class has to offer. Trust me, it will be your best friend for years. During object creation, you have no control over the initial state of an object, so all modifications must be made afterwards. The most performant way to do this would be to first create your object, set properties, and then make connections to keep track of things, but I'll go explain that in another video. For now, we'll just deal with functions and events. Functions are similar to what other coding languages call methods. In short, functions are bundles of code that can be executed by scripts. They can also have parameters, which is what we call data that is passed through a function. This will be covered in a future video. Functions in code and functions of classes are similar but different. The main difference being that class functions are built in, and regular functions are your own code. You can call class functions to make use of the engine, while regular functions are better for building your own code architecture. The last thing I wanted to cover today is events. Events are triggers that can be utilized to run code in a variety of ways, most commonly using connections, which will be covered once we get into scripting. You can make your own events using remote events and bindable events, but that requires knowledge of security and proper client-server communication, and I'm sure you'll do just fine, as long as you're persistent about learning, right? You're... I mean, you're watching this. In the future, I'll touch more on the left out details of this video. I just didn't want to cram too much information into what's supposed to be like a basic introduction. Before I go though, there is one last thing I must tell you. Any changes made to the client side, stay on the client side. If you don't understand that yet, take it as a hint at the next video. Anyway, good luck out there. It's like 
crazy outside. I don't really know what's happening. Why is the air spicy? 